Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Swiss-born, New York City-based jazz musician Elian Ahmed. She opened up about her new 2022 CD, navigating this COVID world since 2020 and her life in music. She is a singer, guitarist, and songwriter, and a true cosmopolitan artist. She was born in Switzerland, lives in New York, and it's that city's multicultural energy that influences the unique sound of her original compositions that are jazzy, groovy, and rooted in African, Brazilian, and Latin music. She's got a great story. Enjoy. All right. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So you've got a brand new album coming out on January 28th. Talk mm-hmm. to me a little bit about kind of not only the project, but coming out during a, such a strange time on earth with all of this COVID stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the project is, um, each song is featuring a wine. And uh, it's called La Degustation, which basically means wine tasting. So it's a musical wine tasting. What I did, I went to my home uh, area in Switzerland, which is like a valley where they produce a lot of wine. So wine has been, it's kind of like uh, in our everyday life living there, kind of like in California. Uh, I visited wineries, I talked to uh, winemakers, sommeliers, etc. Pretty much I wanted to know how they describe their uh, their wines, uh, their passion, etc. And then with these words, with these uh, adjectives, with these descriptions, then I went back to New York City and I started to write the songs. Because of the pandemic, actually, we had time to rehearse it, <laughs> which in, uh, in New York City, it's, sometimes it's a little hard to like, usually when I did uh, uh, recordings in the past, I would have the band come in like to rehearsals and go into the studio, boom. Uh, this time around, since people had time with Amanda Ruzza and Rosa Avila and me, we really, for a few months, we, we met uh, every week in a rehearsal studio and we tried to develop like a trio sound and really work out um, arrangements and stuff. And I, uh, in this way, it was a good thing. And also, it's sort of like uh, this whole project carried me through the pandemic, you know, with a purpose, so to say. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful project. So, you know, I guess it's, you know, during this time of self-reflection and everybody's going through their things, it was probably a good thing to kind of reconnect with your roots in Switzerland with this, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Was, um, I always have a foot in my roots in Switzerland. I did other projects in the past where I took, like, folk songs from Switzerland and I arranged it. I'm a big uh, Brazilian music fan and I play a lot of Brazilian music and I'm very influenced by that. And one thing that Brazilian artists do, they, they really, really treasure their, um, their roots and their, uh, their, their, their heritage, their musical heritage. And a lot of young artists were always recording old uh, standards, so to say, you know. So I was like, wow, uh, why don't I do this with my own uh, heritage and my own roots and, and see what's around and I just transform it, you know, in my style, so to say. And so this was, uh, this wasn't really a stretch for me. I, it was just, uh, I guess I'm kind of nostalgic. <laughs> and, and so I'm very tied to my roots. And these are, of course, uh, awesome roots because they're, uh, wine roots. <laughs> <laughs> they taste very, very wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> and I guess my next follow-up to that is, is that what do you ultimately want to get the listener that either downloads or buy, buys this? What do you want them to get from this project? Well, you know what? It's, it's really about the finer things in life. And uh, I think we really need this. You know, we need a little bit, you know, get, you know, get distracted or get uplifted because everything is such a downer and everything is difficult. And so I think it's, it's, it's all okay just to have a moment of, of lightheartedness. And, and I feel that, um, wine and music is kind of like doing this. It's really emphasizing the, 
uh, it just it just makes life more beautiful. Both products they're not really necessary to survive, but they make life more life worthy, more more prickling. I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's go back to your roots uh, in Switzerland. Talk to me a little bit about how you got involved with music and more specifically jazz and how it kind of took off for you. I had a band in my teenage uh, in my teenage uh, times, or how do you say my teenagehood? <laughs> uh, so I, I, from the very good get go, I always had my own band and um, always wrote my own music. And then we were sort of like a couple of friends that that discovered jazz and we were like, oh, you got to check this album out. You got to check that album out. You know, back in the day, there wasn't, when I was a teenager, we didn't have YouTube and stuff like that. So we had to go to the local uh, uh, CD store where this uh, figure, Jean-Pierre, was. He's kind of like a co- uh, uh, an icon. And you got to imagine I'm coming from a, a little town in the mountains. So... <laughs> So you were like ordering an album and then pretty much after a month you would have it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that's kind of like the story. But uh, the way I really got into jazz is that um, my guitar teacher, I was like uh, studying classical guitar and he turned me on to uh, flamenco guitar. And so I discovered Paco de Lucia and via Paco de Lucia, I came across uh, Friday night at San Francisco with Aldi Neola and Sean McLaughlin, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. And via that, I sort of got into, like, the Miles Davis, the 70s stuff, and via the 70s stuff, I got into the older stuff. So I kind of like the jazz backwards, yeah, age-wise. And my dad always had... He always had some uh, a limited uh, selection of LPs when I was a kid, but really interesting stuff. Like he had a Louis Armstrong record. He had one where on one side was Billy Holiday, on the other one was Ella Fitzgerald. He had like I don't know the Golden Gate Quartet <laughs> and, and Harry Belafonte, etc. And I always loved those records, but I didn't know that was jazz. You know, to me it was just music. But later when I was looking at the, the records, I was like, oh, wow, that's quite a interesting selection for somebody in the mountains. <laughs> so I've been listening to that as a kid, you know, as well. What was the first live jazz show that you saw that really blew you away? Oh, well, I mean, that definitely blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I first came to New York, I first came with a friend just to check out the scene. I didn't come like move here right away, and we were very young. And we would go to the the jazz clubs, and you know, like it was just like, whoa, what's going on here? And so we were two girls, very young, and the uh, the musicians were like, oh wow, you like jazz? So within a week, we were on everybody's guest list. <laughs> So that was quite exciting. <laughs> Very exciting time. <laughs> so speaking of New York, was that always your dream to come to America and pursue jazz? You know, I just wanted to get out <laughs> my valley. <laughs> I wanted to study music because uh, I guess that's kind of like a Swiss trade. Like even with music, it's, it's good to have a diploma. <laughs> Yeah. As a Swiss person. <laughs> so I was like looking at my options and I said like, okay, I could go to Paris or to Vienna, et cetera. And then after I came to New York, I was like, what do I go to Paris for when I can go to New York, you know? <laughs> so I, I, it, it took a little while because, of course, the whole expedition isn't uh really cheap and I tried to organize things and student loans, et cetera. And I came to the new school and uh, finished my jazz studies here, and then I got stuck in New York, and I've been here ever since. What about mentors? You know, when you got here and really started kind of sinking your teeth into higher education, who really kind Mm -hmm. of guided the way that you would, you know, find your voice and, and, you know, your footing in jazz? Well, I don't know. I can't really say that I had, like, a a specific mentor, uh, you know, uh, but I would say... My mentors 
were the jazz musician or the Brazilian musician or the Latin musicians of the jazz of the of the New York music scene, you know that uh, when I started gigging here, I would uh, get the gig and I would hire these people and I really had the chance to to play with with amazing musicians and by playing with them, I just learned so much, you know. That's pretty much my school, I would say. Yeah, well, and you've had the chance to really perform with a lot of big names in the world of jazz. And I'm curious, what have you learned from, like, the legends and luminaries that, you know, you teach younger players now that you're around? I'd say, wow, interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. Hmm, i got to think about that. Well, I, in the new school, I had, a, I had a, an ensemble with uh, Reggie, uh, workman, which was uh, interesting. He was he was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I learned a lot from that. And he was, for example, he said like, "Oh yeah, so uh, write the uh, you gotta write the tune and stuff." And I was like, when I was in new school, I was like, I don't have time for writing tunes now, because I I have to study. I have to like spend my time studying. And he told me like, well. Writing a tune is the best way you can study, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's true, you know. It's it's very true. If you do your own thing, you try your to find your own voice. Uh, composing is is an excellent way to do it. What what was the most surprising thing to you about moving to America and getting kind of involved with the American culture and pursuing this dream? Ooh, uh, well. Uh, one thing um, that I quickly learned was, um, you know, when I went out and trying to get gigs, etc., uh, it's uh, Swiss people are more modest, you know. Or when I even when I didn't live in New York uh, at the beginning, and I came here, and uh, you know, people were like, "Ah, oh, so you're playing music? So what do you do?" And then I felt like, "Oh, you know, I'm studying." And then they would like look at me with a pitiful look. <laughs> So quickly I learned that if you want to get ahead here in the scene, you have to be very confident and not modest at all. So, like, you have to constantly pitch yourself. So that was a little it's, – it's somewhat exhausting also, and thankfully I don't have to do this that much anymore because <laughs> I know – now I know more people, et cetera, but at the beginning I had to constantly – you have to constantly pitch yourself like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm on tour here, I'm doing – this concert, etc. Yeah, so I think it was just more of an really always like an advertising kind of mood all the time. You know, that was something uh, cultural. I thought was was different. So you know, now that you're really firmly in, you know, th this is your career in music. What do you like the best about being a professional musician? Gosh, you know, I just love being on stage. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a wonderful thing and and to have an audience it's really it's really a highlight you know that's the highlight you you work a lot for to be there just to get everything organized and line up etc it's a lot of work just to do to do it once you're on stage it's like with especially playing together i also do solo concerts but i really like playing together with musicians and there you can really sometimes there's just some magic happening and then another aspect of course now that was a little uh limited is the uh, traveling to interesting places you know i mean just because of music i've been to places that gosh i would never have gone there like countries like mongolia or 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 malaysia or myanmar or you know countries like that when would i have ever gone there and one very uh, uh, cool thing about being a musician is that when you get to these countries, immediately you are in touch with local people. So if you're playing at a, uh, at a festival or you're playing at a concert, you get to know uh, musicians from there, you get to know uh, locals, organizers, and they take you around, they show you the place, etc. So if you were a tourist, Maybe you would never even experience uh, those sort of things. Talk to me a little bit about returning to the stage. You know, we're at a point right now where 
we are hopefully at the end, getting towards the end of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. What do you hope we all realize about the power of live music when we do kind of return in earnest to the stage and get back to it? Well, I hope in New York sometimes it's uh, it's hard, uh, you know, to get the attention of people. Um, you know, people have so many uh, before the pandemic. It's just hard to get people out to get the uh, attention because uh, people are have they have gazillions of possibilities what they could see art wise, music wise every day, right? It's it's nice to to have people to really appreciate and come and uh, you know, appreciate the like the, the actual live music. And I saw it last year, yeah, last last summer or is it already two years ago? I don't know, like these days things just kind of blend together <laughs> during the pandemic. I don't know anymore <laughs> which year it yeah. was. <laughs> I didn't know what time it was. I had just at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, I was in Switzerland and I had this, uh, this, I think it was summer 2020, where there was just like a little bit of a, of a light uh, and you could do some outdoor concerts. And we did this, this, this outdoor concert in the Italian part of Switzerland on a big piazza, on a big, you know, square. Uh, and people were there. And you could just see how it was just so great. Like, just the appreciation and also for us. It was just beautiful, you know. After all these months of not having performed, it was just like really beautiful. So I hope that'll last a little bit after the pandemic and not, you know, go right, uh, you know, like, especially in, I feel like in other places, people come to see you, especially what in New York is a little bit of a fight for attention, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately... You live your life. You have a perception of yourself. Who do you think you are? <laughs> well, uh, that's quite an intense question here, huh? Like, uh, who yeah. do I think I am? <laughs> <laughs> who, do, who do you think you are? Um, who do you think you I, are, yep. Who you, who you think you are? For, I kind of made my life a little bit like my own bubble, and I do... Uh, I do where, what I find joy in. I play music. I create my own music. I go play all over the world if it's possible, of course. So I, I do, and also, you know, like the topics I pick, the subjects, like this wine record. I do what I enjoy. So I created myself a, wine, a, a life, my own life. I, I set it up like this. But I also work very hard. Uh, to uh, achieve this, you know, I, I organize and call and write and like, and I invite people. It, it's just all the administrative stuff, setting up meetings, etc., um, takes also a lot of time uh, in my life. So I do, I, I go the mile for uh, to make all this possible for sure. In a private, uh, like more privately, I just, uh, you know, I, I get some time. Um, I mean, I like action, but I'm also kind of chill. I like, I like a nice glass of wine at the end of the evening, and I like swimming, and uh, you know, <laughs> what can I say? I like nature. Yeah. yeah. I dig so. it. Absolutely. Perfect. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. Good luck with the album and the return Thank to the stage. You. I appreciate it. That was very yeah. nice talking to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Switzerland, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Elion for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.